Hi, Internet. This is Annalisa <laughs> Lukes and Jay Lukes in the background there uh, from the Lukes Network. We are here coming to you live on Instagram TV from Tablas Creek Vineyard. And we are so privileged and honored to have Jason Haas here with us for the next few minutes as we talk with him about winemaking in general, but really about sustainability and what that means. As you know, we're a sustainability oriented marketing firm and we always want to know how we can always leave the land better than we found it. Right, Jason? Uh, if there's not something which is more in keeping with the way that a winery should think, I don't know what it is. So let's go a little bit into that. I mean, Tablas Creek is a big name and has been for quite some time. You were named one of the top, what, 50, top 100 and, uh, a few years ago, a couple of years in, in a row. Um, but tell us the roots in a nutshell of Tablas Creek. We know you've got a partnership with uh, Chateau de Bucastel yeah. uh, in the Rhone region. Yeah, so um, Tablas Creek was always conceived of as a partnership. It's mm. equally owned and run by two families. Mm -hmm. One of the families is my family. My dad was a wine importer for mm -hmm. his main adult career. Mm -hmm. Um, the other family is the Perrin family from Chateau de Beaucastel in mm -hmm. Chateau de Pop, whose wine my dad represented as their importer mm -hmm. starting in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So they came up with the idea of doing a Rhone project together in California using the same grapes that they were used to working with in Chateau de Pop mm -hmm. um, in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. um, it took them a long time to get the money saved up and help mm -hmm. their other businesses. But in 85, they started looking for a spot. And in 89, bought 120 acres here in the hills west of Paso. Mm -hmm. um, we, we realized pretty quickly that several of the grape varieties we wanted to work with had never been used in California before. Mm -hmm. So almost the first thing that we did was take cuttings of some of the vines at Bocastel, bring them into the country, mm -hmm. waited three years for them to clear a U.S. government mandated quarantine. Three years, did you say? I did. Yeah. Yeah, three years. Okay. Um, and then built a grapevine nursery to propagate the six cuttings you're allowed to bring in of each type into mm. the thousands you need to start planting a vineyard. So okay. it's a very long, slow development. Wow. We bought the property in 89. We got vines on the ground finally in 94. Yeah. And then it takes three years to get your first crop. So then in 97. That's quite a long investment of time and patience. <laughs> yes. Hopes and emotions, I'm sure, <laughs> right? Um, but... Having started from all that and having done all of that to get to where you are, at what point did you realize, and maybe it was pretty soon thereafter, that sustainability and biodynamic farming is something that you were going to be a leader in? Well, Bocastel has been fully organic since the 1960s. Okay. So we came in with that as our baseline, feeling okay. like that was one of the ways that we were going to make sure that the wines that we made here tasted like this place and couldn't have been made anywhere else. Um, and it was really that conviction, the idea that we were trying to minimize what we were going to put on from outside mm -hmm. and, and try to produce everything here that mm -hmm. led us from organics to biodynamics gradually mm -hmm. over the next couple of decades, mm -hmm. where like a good example would be like, it's better to use organic fertilizer than it is to use chemical fertilizer, but wouldn't it be better to have our own flock of sheep create our own fertilizer from their manure from our own weeds? Yeah, it would, because again, that's one thing that we don't have to bring in from the outside. Mm -hmm. We also then don't have to run our tractors through the vineyard as much and compact the soil to get rid of the weeds. Mm -hmm. It all kind of takes care of itself. Self-sustaining and really um, even probably more advanced than organic, because I read that biodynamic farming actually predated organic farming uh, to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, the idea is really they're going after similar ends, but it's a very different kind of process. Yeah. Organic is essentially a list of things you can't use. Yeah. So if you want to be organic, you have to not use chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers, and um, chemical herbicides. Mm -hmm. Like you do that, you go through an audit, you're organic. Mm -hmm. Biodynamics is essentially the effort to create a healthy ecosystem in your farm so that you don't need to intervene whether with chemicals or non-chemical means because you have a habitat for the insects that are going to take care of the pests you don't want. You have some way of turning um, turning your soil into something with more life and more fertility mm -hmm. just through natural processes mm -hmm. every year. So it's a, it's a much more kind of holistic way to think about sustainability than organic, yeah. which is often involves like substituting a non-chemical product for a chemical product. Got it. And really you're creating everything from within your ecosystem and keeping it internal right I mean, we figure like the less we bring in from the outside the yeah. better chance we have for our wines to taste really intensely of this place that's amazing and so how does that if at all affect production 
does it affect um, the volume that you produce or did it affect the volume you produce or is there an impact on, on that end? Because um, wine, wine making and, and wine is also a business, right? In addition to all the it other is? things. It's an art. <laughs> um, it's an art and a business. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer that question okay. just because it's not like we have a before and after. It's yeah. not like we have a, well, we used to be farming chemically in a modern way. Yeah. Now we're farming biodynamically. Yeah. And I can tell you before it cost us X per acre. Right. Now it costs us Y. Mm -hmm. um, so what I can say is that, I mean, we're able to get a solid yield in terms of tons per acre. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not huge. We get something like two and a half tons an acre, which is not a big number, but it's mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. um, the vines are incredibly healthy and become more resilient every year because they are they are set up to succeed. They're given yeah. soils that are in great shape. They're given mm -hmm. an ecosystem that supports them. Mm -hmm. And we know that whereas a lot of our neighbors have to replant grapevines at 20 or 25 years old just because they get exhausted. Our vines, I mean, our oldest vines will be 30 next year and they're still going strong. So wow. I feel like there's a real quality benefit in the long run. Mm -hmm. And if there are costs, the costs are mostly at the front end mm -hmm. as yeah. you're getting your ecosystem set up. And mm -hmm. once it's established, um, it should be pretty self-sustaining. Now, I know you're in the middle of harvest, so it's really kind and generous of you to spend a little bit of time here. And they're also in the middle of um, releasing, introducing some of their newer wines. And, you know, he travels typically quite a bit to talk about Tablas Creek and engage restaurants all over the country in big cities, which Orange County, he was just in, um, what, a week or so ago. Um, but going back to the ecosystem, tell us about what that looks like here on your property, 120 acres on the west side. So, so yeah, so we have 120 acres of vineyard um, from our original property, and then we bought the next parcel to the south of us 10 years ago, more or less. So that's another 150 acres. So we've got mm -hmm. 270 acres. Mm -hmm. Of that, we have about 105 acres of producing vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, so vines that we planted mostly in the, in the, the, late, the, the mid to late 90s. Mm -hmm. um, then we have another 20 acres of newly planted vineyard that's not in production yet. Mm -hmm. Another 40 acres of land that has been, that is just grassland that mm -hmm. was um, on the new property that we bought that had been a walnut orchard that we pulled the walnuts out and had mm -hmm. been grazing our flock of sheep over there and um, building that soil fertility and getting ready to plant. So that will be planted in the next decade, little mm -hmm. by little. And then we've got about 80 acres of forest land, wild oak land, oak woodland, that is going to stay as it is. And it provides a, a habitat for all sorts of important important animals and, and insects and birds and um, provides a lot of the beauty that I think people look wow. forward to and come into Paso Robles. So wow. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a diverse, um, diverse ecosystem within that, mm -hmm. in that property. And then on the property, in addition to the grapevines, we've got a flock of 200 sheep. Um, we had our first lambs of the season um, day before yesterday. Wow. So if you come back in six weeks, we'll have 200 sheep and 250 lambs running around. Wow. Um, we've also got a couple of big uh, Spanish mastiffs that keep the flock safe from mountain lions and wow. coyotes. Mm -hmm. um, we've got uh, a couple of alpacas and a donkey just for local color. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've, in addition to the grapevines, we've interplanted several hundred fruit trees around mm -hmm. the vineyard because each different species of plant that you have attracts a slightly different spe different collection of insects mm -hmm. and provides uh, microbes for the for the soil to have mm -hmm. a kind of healthy resilient soil. Mm -hmm. Now was that something that was designed particularly for the soil that's in this area or is that a typical um, combination of what a biodynamic ecosystem and wine farming would be? So the specific plants that you might have would mm -hmm. vary if you're in a Mediterranean climate like we are. Yeah. It would be different than if you're in a continental climate or, yeah. a, or a, say, a grassland climate. Yeah. But um, the idea of having not just your crop, mm -hmm. but also a, a diverse collection of other plants, other perennial plants that do well mm -hmm. in that climate, mm -hmm. and then trying to incorporate animals however you can. Because if you think of your normal farm unit, like there's no animals and that's mm -hmm. an unnatural ecosystem because animals play a really crucial role mm -hmm. of acting as composters. They mm -hmm. eat, they eat uh, woody or leafy or grassy material yeah. and turn it into soil. Yeah. Um, and so 
They also hold microbes in their guts, which yeah. is particularly important in a dry climate like this, where mm -hmm. it rains only in the winter. Mm -hmm. So having figuring out a way to incorporate animals into this biodiverse ecosystem mm -hmm. is a really central tenet of biodynamics, and mm -hmm. one of the things that we feel like is one of the keys to su mm -hmm. succeeding in doing it. I'll ask a couple more questions, because again, um, Jason's in Harvest right now. So the first question <laughs> would be, if you were to describe, we'll say, uh, use two or three words to describe how this place tastes, what would the words be? Um, so I think what would what, what defines the wines that we make here are basically vibrancy and balance mm -hmm. and minerality. Mm -hmm. So vibrancy in the sense that sometimes wines can taste just like fruit or just like mm -hmm. tannin, be kind of these dense, powerful things. Mm -hmm. um, the one of the things of the one of the contributions of biodynamic farming and also one of the contributions of the Robles climate um, is this lift. So you have these denser elements, but you've mm -hmm. also got like freshness mm -hmm. and floral and um, uh, brightness to them. So that vibrancy is one piece. Mm -hmm. um, the second, and this is really something that we inherit from our partners at Bocastel, is balance. Like we want fruit, yeah. but we want the fruit to be in balance with spice and minerality mm -hmm. and herbs and mm -hmm. tannin and we don't want any one of those to dominate we mm -hmm. want aspects of all of them mm -hmm. um, and then finally minerality you can probably see behind behind us um, this great limestone soil yes. that we have it's mm -hmm. this kind of white chalky rock that you mm -hmm. can find every road cut that you drive by in Paso Robles mm -hmm. um, this is the the bedrock in a lot of the great wine regions in Europe, but it's rare in California, mm -hmm. um, and it's why we're in Paso Robles and not in Sonoma or Napa mm -hmm. or the Sierra foothills that also have a climate that's similar to this. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the contributions of these soils is this almost saline, like like sea spray mm -hmm. finish on mm -hmm. the wines. Okay. Um, and I love the way that that kind of highlights the the fruit um, and the freshness and keeps it keeps it balanced and keeps it clean. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Very illustrative words, <laughs> I want a glass now. Um, okay, I said that was the last question, but really, um, what would you want the legacy of Tablas Creek to be? So generations from now, and that's part of what sustainability is about, is thinking not just about now, but into the future, um, long after, We've moved on. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like we have a chance to leave two significant legacies. Mm -hmm. One is that we were one of the pioneers of, of the California Rhone movement. Mm -hmm. And when we brought in cuttings of all of our grapes from Bocasta, we made mm -hmm. the decision early on that we weren't going to try to keep those grapes proprietary, mm -hmm. but we're instead going to make them available to the broader community. Wow. And we've sold 5 million grapevine cuttings to wow. 600 vineyards from Washington State to Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like that kind of that f kind of flowering of this whole family of grape varieties mm -hmm. is one of the things that you can trace directly back to that decision that we made. So yeah. that's one. The other is that last year we became the first winery in the world to be certified regenerative organic. Mm -hmm. So that is a framework which builds on biodynamic, uh, but also includes commitments to reducing your use of resources like energy and water. Nice. For example, we're 100% solar powered here and we're largely dry farmed, so we don't have to pull out groundwater to irrigate. Um, it also includes commitments to animal welfare. Mm -hmm. So the flock of sheep that we have has an animal welfare certification that, they, that they're treated humanely. And then finally, a farm worker fairness pillar Good. where it shows you have to be audited to show that not only are you paying your farm workers a living wage, not only are their working conditions safe, but also you are soliciting and mm -hmm. encouraging and acting upon their feedback. We mm -hmm. do roundtable discussions every Friday all through the growing season, all through the harvest wow. with our field crew and talk about what we've done, talk about what we have coming up and get their suggestions and get their ideas. So to show that, to show your the, the guys who have their boots on the ground and their hands on the vines mm -hmm. that their input is not just allowed but welcomed. Well, that's wonderful. So at the Luke's Network, we talk about the triple bottom line, people, profit, planet, do well and do good. But on the people side, it's employee engagement. It sounds like you're, you've got that spot on. We're asking people, the people that you really are, you're, they're your first customers. 
they're your frontline customers about their feedback is what propels businesses forward. I, I totally agree. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the other P, which is um, in terms of um, where we can get your wine. Obviously, you can come to Paso Robles here in beautiful. Please do, come to Paso Robles. Paso it's Robles. a wonderful place. It's only four and a half hours from South Orange County, about three and a half from Los Angeles. Um, but where else could, could we purchase your wine? So, the the easiest place to start because we have we we're not a huge winery but we do have yeah. distribution at least in a limited way in most most markets. Yeah. So um, the easiest thing to do is if you go onto our website, which yeah. is just tublescreek.com, yeah. um, there is a section under wines called Find Our Wine, mm -hmm. and you can plug in where you are, and oh, all of the restaurants nice. or wine shops that have our wines yeah. that are near you will pop up. Great. Um, and then there's always wines that we make that don't make it into distribution, things that are scarce that we just sell here. So mm -hmm. um, while, you're, while you're on that website, you can also check those out. Mm -hmm. And you can become a member. And you can become a wine club member. Because then you can have access to all that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jason. I hope we get to do this again, perhaps in a different season. Um, we really appreciate, on behalf of Jay and myself, um, Annalisa Lukes, we appreciate the time that you spent with us and the insight and the passion, the transparency, the authenticity. These are all words that we value um, as a firm. So thank you so much. And totally uh, yeah, come to Tablas Creek. <laughs> Check it Thanks, out. Thanks, everybody. It's very different and great. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. Awesome. Right, and you actually gave great answers. They were, they were just fantastic, man. <laughs>